Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to Together Facing Breast Cancer. Um, uh, first, uh, I'm Rick Bleicher. I wanna thank our patients, our caregivers, our advocates and guests for joining us this evening. I'm Dr. Rick Bleicher, a professor in the Department of Surgical Oncology and the leader of the breast cancer program here at Fox Chase Cancer Center. Tonight, my colleagues and I are going to share the latest research and treatment developments for breast cancer. Um, throughout the program, please feel free to leave questions in the chat feature on Facebook, and we will get back to you later in the evening. But before we continue, I want to take a moment to honor those that we've lost to cancer. So with that, please join me for a moment of silence. Thank you. I'd also like to thank our exhibitors for the evening. It's because of their generous support that we can offer this free program to you tonight. Our gold exhibitors are Karis, Foundation Medicine, and Tempest. Our silver exhibitors are Genentech, Lilly, Novartis, Puma Biotechnology, and CGen. And we also want to give a special thanks to Susan G. Komen of Philadelphia, Living Beyond Breast Cancer, and Unite for Her. As always, we appreciate your partnership in the breast cancer community. So now I want to turn it over to our panel for the evening. Each of my colleagues are going to introduce themselves um, and they're going to share a presentation that they put together for the evening. So we're going to basically do this in the order of risk, diagnosis, and treatment. And we're going to start with Dr. Kristen Whitaker, who's going to talk about assessment of risk and genetics. Dr. Whitaker. Good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Whitaker, as Dr. Fleischer just mentioned. I'm a breast medical oncologist in cancer clinical geneticist at Fox Chase Cancer Center. And I'm very happy to be here tonight and talk to you a little bit about breast cancer genetics and how this kind of fits into the whole picture of your breast cancer care. Next slide. So I always like to start by just giving you an overview of what we describe as inherited breast cancer. So essentially these are breast cancers that develop in the setting of um, a gene that's essentially passed through the family to increase one's risk of developing breast cancer over their lifetime. So when we think about the grand scheme of, of breast cancers, most breast cancers are not going to be inherited breast cancers, but we know that about 5 to 10% of breast cancers that develop are related to genes that are passed through the family. And I find that, you know, some, some patients will have heard a little bit about inherited breast cancer and genes that may cause breast cancer. And when, when patients know about these genes, normally the genes that we know about are BRCA1 and BRCA2. I mean, these were our first discovered uh, breast cancer genes back in the 1990s. So we know a little bit about these genes and we continue to learn more about them and, and, and how they become important for um, you know, understanding our risk of breast cancer, but also even treatment for breast cancer nowadays. Um, when we think about BRCA genes, it's important to remember that breast cancer genes can be passed from either your mother or your father. So it can be passed from a male or a female. And similarly, you can pass these genes on to a son or a daughter. Um, and it's important to know that it's not only uh, breast cancer risks that come with the BRCA gene, there are other cancer risks and they can have relevance for both men and women. I'll talk to you about them a little bit more um, in some future slides. Next slide. So whenever I talk about BRCA, I actually always put this picture of Angelina Jolie, who's a popular um, actress because she really actually had a pretty pivotal role in terms of kind of bringing media attention to the BRCA gene and what we can do to kind of manage the cancer risk. So back in 2013, Angelina Jolie revealed that she had a BRCA1 mutation and she talked very publicly about her decision to undergo what we call prophylactic or preventative surgeries to reduce her risk of both breast cancer and um, ovarian cancer that can be rest with these uh, BRCA genes. Um, and we saw when she was such a public figure that we actually saw a dramatic increase in the uptake of genetic testing, as well as some of these preventative surgeries, such as risk-reducing bilateral mastectomy, or what people commonly call double mastectomy. So I always put her in here because I think this term that they coined called the Angelina effect was a very real thing we saw. Next slide. So a little bit about cancer risks that we see with the BRCA gene. So just a reminder that, you know, BRCA are these genes that we know account for probably about 60% of the inherited breast cancer that we see, but there are some other genes which I'll talk to you about. 
So I think in terms of cancer risks, I think a lot of women, especially women who are at this talk, may know that BRCA1 and BRCA2 come with risk of breast cancer. That's much higher than, than what an average risk woman has. So an average risk woman has about a 10 to 12% lifetime risk of breast cancer. Women with BRCA mutations can have up to about an 87% lifetime risk of developing breast cancer. In addition to breast cancer risk, both of these genes also increase your risk of developing ovarian cancer. Um, they also increase your risk of second breast cancers. We especially see second breast cancers as kind of a, a more elevated risk in BRCA1 mutation carriers, but also in BRCA2 mutation carriers. And then, you know, a risk that we probably know a little less about kind of generally in the public is that the BRCA2 gene can also increase your risk of prostate cancer. And what's not shown on here, but it is an important risk that we've kind of, you know, now been able to identify and quantify is these genes can also increase your risk of pancreatic cancer, particularly BRCA2. Next slide. So just a little bit about breast cancer and BRCA caries. So remember, BRCA1 and BRCA2 by far are going to be the most common causes of inherited breast cancer. And we do see that we have some differences in breast cancer diagnosing and BRCA mutation carriers. So for starters, women or men who carry um, BRCA mutations, they get diagnosed with breast cancer at younger ages. So it wouldn't be uncommon for us to see a BRCA mutation carrier be diagnosed with breast cancer in her 20s or, or early 30s. Um, BRCA carriers are often um, more likely to develop a second breast cancer. The kind of risk of what these second breast cancer is, how, you know, how often these happen, is quite variable kind of depending on the source that you read. But you know, to estimate it anywhere from kind of about 40% risk of developing a second breast cancer would be quite accurate in, in mutation carriers. Um, and then a couple of things about the characteristics of the cancer itself. So for BRCA1 mutation carriers, we know they have a predisposition to this type of breast cancer called triple negative breast cancer, which is really our um, most aggressive form of breast cancer that we treat. Um, so it's important to be able to identify these women and try to prevent breast cancer when we can. Um, and then BRCA2 mutation carriers are a bit different. They have kind of our more classic and common type of breast cancer, which is what we call estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. Next slide. So I won't go over this in great detail, but I put this on here just to kind of give you an overview of the fact that now we know that there are several other genes outside of just BRCA1 and BRCA2, which you see are right here, that cause breast cancer. So like I said, these were the genes we discovered back in the 1990s. But since that time, when we've kind of expanded our testing and continued looking for genes that increase um, breast cancer risk, we've identified quite a few other genes. And what I really always think is important to point out, very similar to BRCA1 and BRCA2, where there are risk of other types of cancer, such as ovarian or pancreatic and prostate, the same is true for most of these other genes that we've identified. Um, so we essentially know that they have a breast cancer risk, but they also have a risk of other types of cancer. So for example, a gene called PALB2 can have about a 60% lifetime risk of breast cancer, but it also can have a small risk of ovarian cancer. It also can have a small risk of pancreatic cancer. Um, and if you kind of look at this list, these, these genes all are here with the breast cancer risk, but many of them also have ovarian cancer risk, and many of them have other cancer risk outside of breast and ovarian. And then the only other thing that I think is kind of important to point out here, just like we said, BRCA1 is associated with triple negative breast cancer, we're also seeing as we continue to learn more about some of these breast cancer genes that there are other breast cancer genes too, which are, um, you know, make patients more likely to develop this most aggressive type of breast cancer called triple negative breast cancer. And namely those genes are BARD1, RAD51C, RAD51D. This is something we really have just learned over really like the last year or so. Next slide. So I think one of the, the biggest questions kind of becomes with breast cancer is once you have a breast cancer diagnosis, who really should undergo genetic testing? And I will tell you kind of as we continue to study the genes that increase a woman's risk, as we continue to make advancements in how we use genetic information to treat our patients, 
the women with breast cancer who should be getting genetic testing, that kind of list or criteria for women is continuing to grow. I really say every few years, more and more women really should be considering genetic testing when they have a breast cancer diagnosis. But just a couple of things that I think are important to diagnose categories where we say, absolutely, you always should get genetic testing if you have a breast cancer diagnosis. So if you have what we call an early onset breast cancer, meaning less than age 45, you should get genetic testing. Anyone with male breast cancer, because again, we know things like that BRCA2 gene mutation are very common. Anyone with triple negative breast cancer, we just talked about how we know there are quite a few genes that are associated specifically with triple negative breast cancer. So this is important because this is pretty different over just this last year is that now we say regardless of what age, so even if you're, you know, a 75 year old woman with triple negative breast cancer, we still recommend that you get genetic testing because you could have a genetic cause of your cancer. Um, anytime you've had two separate breast cancers, so a breast cancer in your right and then 10 years later, a breast cancer in your left, that's the kind of patient we would say to test. There are certain patients of certain ethnic backgrounds, such as Ashkenazi Jewish patients, that we recommend testing because we know rates of BRCA mutation specifically are higher in these groups. And then I think, you know, the category of patients that we don't necessarily think about, but it is important because you qualify for genetic testing, is, you know, if you're a patient and you have breast cancer, and then you also have a family member that has other types of cancer, so namely things like pancreatic cancer, ovarian cancer, a high-risk prostate cancer or another breast cancer diagnosed at a, a young age, we recommend that you go, you undergo genetic testing. And again, it's because of genes like the BRCA gene that we know we can find when we see these kind of family histories of cancer. And then the other group that I point out, because I think sometimes it's a, a group that we miss in terms of genetic testing, are really individuals who are adopted or who don't know their family history because you know there could be kind of that risk in the family, but we just don't know details to say, hey, you should get genetic testing. So we normally think it's a good idea for you to consider genetic testing in those situations also. Next slide. And I won't go over this in great detail, but I just point this out to, you know, especially any family members of, of patients that may have breast cancer that are, are listening to this talk. You know, even if you yourself don't have a diagnosis of breast cancer, but say, you know, you had a mom or grandma that had breast cancer diagnosed um, at age less than 45, then you can consider genetic testing. Or if you have a close family member, so a first or second degree relative, so that would be like a parent or a grandparent or an aunt or uncle, you could also consider genetic testing if they had any of these types of cancer. So things like ovarian cancer, male breast cancer, pancreatic cancer, um, stage four prostate cancer. Next slide. And then I won't go over this in great detail, but I just put this in here because I think a lot of times patients will say, well, what's going to happen when I go to a genetic counseling visit? But essentially you meet with the genetic counselor. She goes over your personal medical history. She also will talk to you about your family history of cancer in great details. And then essentially she talks to you about the risk and benefits of pursuing genetic testing. She talks to you about the different types of genetic testing. I mean, there are genetic tests where we test just a few genes, and then there are genetic tests where we test uh, bigger groups of genes. Um, and then typically, if you agree to genetic testing, they'll select a blood or saliva sample, and it takes about four weeks to get the results back. Next slide. And then, you know, what I just kind of want to say, just to wrap up this talk, because I think it is an important aspect, especially for patients with breast cancer, is you know, just returning a little bit back to this BRCA gene, even though we know there are other genes that can have breast cancer risk, BRCA still remains our most um, kind of well-known and well-understood gene related to breast cancer risk. And it has important implications for your treatment with breast cancer. So for one, you know, if you had a BRCA mutation, it really could play into your decision about what type of surgery to pursue. Because BRCA mutation carriers will have a, a higher than normal risk of developing a breast cancer in the opposite breast where they don't currently have the cancer, sometimes women will choose to pursue what they call a double mastectomy instead of just having the breast where the, the cancer is operated on. Um, if you don't choose to have kind of a mastectomy where the entire breast is removed, then in these cases, we recommend that you have kind of intensified breast cancer screening after your diagnosis. So instead of just getting a mammogram once a year, which is standard of care, you also get a breast MRI. And the one thing that I just want to highlight, because I think it is important for, for women to know. So really, any patient that has metastatic breast cancer, 
Um, we absolutely recommend that you get genetic testing because we, we want to know if you have a BRCA mutation because it opens up an additional treatment option, something called a PARP inhibitor for your treatment. And I point this out because this is literally brand new data that was just reported over the last six months. We also know that it's not only patients who are metastatic or stage four that benefit from these medicines called PARP inhibitors, also women with these high risk early stage breast cancers also benefit. So it's important if you, if you have certain characteristics like multiple lymph nodes involved or large tumors that you really talk to your doctor about potentially pursuing genetic testing as well. Next slide. And, you know, in the interest of time, I won't go over this, but I just will let you know that if you are here and you're hearing this talk and you say, oh, I have a lot of breast cancer in my family, or I know I have a genetic mutation, Fox Chase has a wonderful risk assessment program where we see patients who don't yet have a diagnosis of, of cancer, and we try to really help them manage risk and reduce their risk of developing future cancers. Next slide. Thank you. Great, Dr. Whitaker, thank you so much for that. That was excellent. Um, all right, Dr. Abbott is gonna talk with us next. Dr. Abbott is a, um, a radiologist in our diagnostic imaging department. So Dr. Abbott, take it away. You're muted. Here we go, yep. Hi everyone, I'm Andrea Abbott. I am a breast radiologist, um, which means that I read screening mammograms um, along with screening ultrasounds. Um, breast MRIs, and I do all the image guided biopsies. Um, so next slide. Um, so screening mammogram is the gold standard um, of breast screening, um, screening for breast cancer. It's quick, it's inexpensive, and it's the only breast imaging test that has shown um, a proven risk or a proven reduction in mortality from breast cancer. Um, however, with that knowledge, we also know that there's no test um, that's going to 100% prove that you do not have breast cancer. Um, and screening cannot prevent breast cancer. The goal of breast cancer screening is to find cancers early when they are more easily treatable. Next slide. Um, so when um, we look at your mammograms, the first thing we do is assess the density. So there are four different um, classifications of density that you can see displayed on the screen here. Um, so there's a uh, fatty breast, um, scattered fibroglandular tissue, heterogeneously dense, and then extremely dense. All categories are normal. Um, it just depends on what's normal for you. Next slide. So what does breast density mean? Um, breast density does mean that you do have a slight increased risk of having, of having breast cancer. There are a whole host of factors. Um, but the other thing that is um, more challenging about breast, breast density is that it can mask tumors. Next slide. Um, so on this slide, you can see um, on the left is a fatty breast, and in the red circle, you can see a more dense spot, which is a tumor, um, and you can contrast that with the image on the right, where you can see um, in the red circle is a similar appearing tumor, but it's much more difficult to see. It looks very similar to the dense breast tissue that's around it. Next slide. Um, so what do we do about these patients, along with all the other um, patients who are at even more high risk of developing breast cancer, like Dr. Whitaker was explaining. Um, so we have a bunch of supplemental screening methods, um, including tomosynthesis, which is more popularly known as 3D mammograms. Uh, we also have breast MRI, we have whole breast screening ultrasound, um, we have contrast enhanced mammograms, um, which is something we unfortunately don't offer at Fox Chase yet. And we also have molecular breast imaging. Next slide. Um, so breast MRI is great. Um, it has no ionizing radiation. Um, it does require the injection of intravenous contrast, um, and um, it does take a long time to obtain the imaging. Patients are usually lying um, on their stomachs with a special in a specialized coil um, for 30 to 60 minutes. Um, but it's important because uh, the detection of breast cancer is not affected by breast density. Next slide. Um, so these pictures here um, are um, on the left, you can see a picture of the breast MRI coil. Um, and on the right, you can see an image from a breast MRI and the arrow is pointing at, um, at a tumor. Next slide. 
Um, another thing I want to briefly discuss is molecular breast imaging. Um, so it is another screening study that um, where the detection of breast cancer is not affected by breast density. Uh, for molecular breast imaging, um, you are injected with a radio pharmaceutical and then um, you undergo imaging that's actually similar uh, to a mammogram, um, but you do um, sit in the compression for 10 minutes per each of you. Next slide. Um, so here you can see um, the technology we use to obtain the MBI. Um, so it does look similar to a mammogram unit. Uh, next slide. Um, and um, here you can see um, there's an image of the, a patient's mammogram with very dense breast tissue on the left um, and an image from her molecular breast imaging on the right where you can see the tumor um, that's not really um, seen well at all on the mammogram. Next slide. Um, so this final slide here is just showing um, comparison of the different supplemental screening um, methods that we had. So um, you can see here all the additional cancers um, that are found with these different supplemental screening methods, um, along with some of the um, some of the risks to them. So there's, um, you know, like the technology, the cost of the study, um, and then women who are uh, called back for additional imaging who do not um, end up having breast cancer. Um, so next slide. And next slide. Thank you so much for your time. Great. That was that was fantastic. Thank you, Dr. Abbott. Um, Next, moving on to the surgical area is Dr. Allison Agon. Dr. Agon. Hi, my name is Dr. Allison Agon and I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Surgical Oncology here at Fox Chase and I specialize in breast cancer surgery. Tonight, I'd like to briefly review newer advances in breast cancer surgery. Next slide, please. So we know that women diagnosed with breast cancer do best when they are treated with a team of physicians and healthcare professionals who are working together. We often refer to this as a multidisciplinary approach. And so patients should be at the center of the team, which is described in the illustration on the top right corner there. But what I don't think people often realize is that there's a lot of connections that go on between the specialties who are taking care of the patient, which is, uh, better described in the picture below. I mention this because a lot of advances in breast cancer surgery have a lot to do with the advances in the other breast care specialties. We're only as good as our colleagues. So advances in breast cancer medicine and timing of medicine can tweak nuanced approaches to surgical decision-making. So for example, when we talk about adjuvant strategies that affect you know, surgical advancements, neoadjuvant medicine, okay? If a tumor is too big for breast conservation, medicine can sometimes be given to shrink tumors to give women the option of breast conservation. Sometimes chemotherapy can be given first to clear out tumor from the, the axilla or the armpit, so less surgery is needed in that location. Advances in radiation allow for some women to undergo partial breast re-irradiation if they've already had whole breast radiation for breast cancer in the past. And then new information from our radiology oncology, or I'm sorry, from our radiation oncology colleagues suggests that more women may actually benefit from radiation after mastectomy in certain situations. And that can impact axillary surgical decision-making as well as reconstruction decision-making. In terms of actual surgical techniques, we work closely with our plastics colleagues to offer better cosmetic outcomes by having them work with us side by side to provide breast reductions and lifts at the time of lumpectomies. Our plastics colleagues are also constantly advancing options for reconstruction after mastectomy. But from a standalone surgical advancement, I think the most exciting thing right now would be the adoption of wireless localization technology. Next slide. So Fox Chase began utilizing wireless localization uh, last fall. Next slide. And to explain what this is, 
I think the first question is, why would someone need localization, uh, let alone wireless localization? So as our imaging gets better, we are finding smaller and smaller breast cancers. Most screen detected breast cancers can't actually be felt. So if someone desires a lumpectomy and wants the cancer removed, but they want to keep their breast, how do I as a surgeon know exactly where to operate? Next slide. So for years, the standard of care has been for the patient to undergo a wire placement the morning of surgery. The wire acts as a guide and points to the cancer so I know exactly where to go. This is done by having a needle placed into the breast under mammogram guidance and the wire being placed through the needle and then the needle being removed. The wire, which is left behind, is taped down and sits there until the patient goes to the operating room, which is usually approximately an hour later. Now, I don't mean to be graphic, so if you're a little squeamish, you might wanna look away, but next slide. Here's a picture of a woman undergoing a wire placement and the mammogram as to what it looks like when the needle and the wire are in place. When the lumpectomy is performed, the tissue that's removed is actually x-rayed to make sure that we got the lesion that we were interested in and that the wire in its entirety has been removed. Next slide. So wireless localization means that we can localize the cancer without using a wire. And instead, we are using very tiny seeds that get placed into the breast days ahead of time. Now these seeds are millimeters in size. They are literally the size of a grain of sand. Uh, they are easily placed and the patient won't feel once it's inside. There's various companies that make these seeds and then devices that we use in the operating room to find the seed. At Fox Chase, we are utilizing uh, the Lucent Invisio navigation system. So next slide. And we really find that this is the best technology uh, available on the market right now. Uh, we basically use the fancy pen that's in the, uh, demonstrated in the upper corner there. Uh, it attaches to our cautery device that we use in the operating room. And then we're able to see uh, where exactly the seed is on a screen that's set up next to the operating table. Next slide. So this technology actually gives us a three-dimensional view of where our cautery is in relation to the seed. And in essence, the cancer, since the seed is placed inside of where the cancer is. This allows us to take enough tissue to get around the cancer, but not take more than we actually need. Next slide. So the benefits of going wireless. I think the biggest benefit is patient comfort. Uh, it's much more comfortable for patients the day of surgery, not having a wire sticking out of their breast that can shift and pinch. Another benefit is less anxiety. Many women say that the idea of the wire localization is more anxiety provoking than the idea of their actual cancer surgery. So going wireless provides one less thing to worry about. Going wireless also allows more efficiency the day of surgery. So for patients and providers. So no need to go to another department for another procedure the day of surgery. You can just focus on the surgery itself. And finally, going wireless offers the opportunity to be more precise with our surgery um, and giving us something as close to x-ray eyes as we can get. Wires tend to migrate and shift, so this allows us to possibly take less tissue and be more accurate with our dissection. So wireless localization has been more broadly adopted by various hospital systems throughout the country in recent years, and we're very excited to have this new technology at Fox Chase uh, within the last year. Thanks. Great, Dr. Agon, that was, that was excellent. Thank you so much. Um, all right, so we're now gonna hear from Dr. Um, uh, Mohamed Shuja Shafkat from our Division of Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery. Um, he unfortunately had sort of a last minute issue, but he was able to record his talk for us. Um, so we will be 
um, showing that um, and that pre-recorded presentation we will see right now. Good evening, everyone. I'm sorry I couldn't be there with you tonight, but I wanted to take some time to talk to you all about options in breast reconstruction, and then also touch a little bit on uh, lymphatic reconstruction for patients with lymphedema or at risk for lymphedema. So when we talk about reconstruction after breast cancer surgery, we really divide that into lumpectomy defects, which is if you're just gonna have only the area of cancer removed and mastectomy defects where you're gonna have the entire breast removed. When you have a lumpectomy and you want some sort of reconstruction, we typically use things like a breast lift or breast reduction type technique. And occasionally we can use flaps or tissue from other areas or implants. When you have a mastectomy, typically we will reconstruct the entire breast with an implant, your own tissue, or some sort of combination of the two. So when you have a lumpectomy, um, there's really a significant benefit to doing some sort of reconstruction at the time. And typically these are in larger breasted patients where we can do a reduction at the same time. And out of all the patients we do reconstruction on, they definitely have a significant benefit from a cosmetic standpoint and a uh, decreased risk of complications, especially when done prior to radiation. Um, and it really allows us to do um, larger tumors and patients to have a very good outcome. And so we typically do these very similar to how we would do any breast reduction, but we can really fill in the area where the tumor was taken from, reshape the breast, reposition the nipple, take out excess skin, and really give patients an excellent uh, cosmetic result. When we talk about implant reconstruction, uh, traditionally this was done uh, through a two-stage manner. First was the placement of a temporary inflatable device called a tissue expander, which was subsequently exchanged to a permanent implant. And Traditionally, we were putting these under the muscle. Now, um, we're actually doing a lot of these above the muscle, which has significant benefits from a cosmetic standpoint, as well as a pain and recovery standpoint. And a lot of times, if patients have good anatomy, we can go right to an implant instead of uh, doing the tissue expander first. Um, we're traditionally using a lot of this biologic mesh or acellular dermal matrix, and it's a processed human cadaver skin that they uh, make this biologic mesh out of that really helps us with doing these direct to implants or uh, prefectoral above the muscle. So this is on the left, a traditional tissue expander. Uh, it's an inflatable device. It has a little area that uh, we can put a needle in similar to a chemo port. Um, and then on the right, you have a traditional uh, silicone implant. Um, and again, traditionally, we were putting these under the muscle. Now we're going above the muscle with significant benefits to the patients. In terms of flap reconstruction, when you have a mastectomy, you can use your own tissue. Uh, older versions of this procedure were the tram flap, where we were using the entire rectus abdominis muscle or the six pack muscle uh, along with the tissue. Now we're doing these in a more muscle sparing or muscle preserving fashion with a deep flap or a muscle sparing tram flap. So we were preserving most, if not all of the muscle. We're using microsurgery to disconnect and reconnect the blood supply. And that way it really preserves the muscle. Um, it makes for a better outcome for patients. And typically um, the abdomen or the belly is the gold standard for using a flap. Now, if you're not a good candidate for that, uh, but still wanna use a flap, pretty much the second line version is to use the thigh. Um, and these are things like the pap flap or uh, a gracilis based flap where we use a variety of different scars um, to take tissue from the inner thigh. Um, a lot of patients don't like that because of the scars, but it is a good second line option uh, and most people's second line option after uh, the belly if you want to use your own tissue. And then latissimus flaps are, are good in certain situations. We don't recommend them to everybody, uh, but are good uh, in patients who've had previous radiation. Um, uh, but again, you know, this is a decision between you and your plastic surgeon. Um, I want patients to know that reconstruction is not required. It can be delayed and it does take time and it does take multiple surgeries. Um, the biggest thing I wanted to touch on also is also um, lymphatic reconstruction or reconstruction in patients with lymphedema. So when we talk about delayed lymphatic reconstruction, those are patients who already have lymphedema after their treatment. And these are things like lymphovenous bypass for earlier stage lymphedema or lymph node transfer uh, for patients with later stage lymphedema. The most revolutionary and newest thing we're doing for our breast cancer patients is something called immediate lymphatic reconstruction. So that's about a one hour microsurgical procedure for any patient who's going to have all of the lymph nodes removed from under their arm as part of their treatment. Um, any patient who's going to get that is really a good candidate for this surgery. Um, if we can ever avoid you having lymphedema to begin with, that's a huge benefit in terms of 
time, uh, multiple surgeries, potential complications. So this is the best, uh, you know, best and newest thing we're doing for our breast cancer patients. Sometimes it is difficult with insurance coverage, but obviously we do everything to try to overturn those things. But this has really been a game changer for any patient who's going to have an axillary lymph node dissection or is at risk for lymphedema. Um, with that, I really thank you for your time and your attention. Great. Thank you, Dr. Shafkat. Um, we will now um, move on again, continuing in the order of therapy um, from surgery and plastic surgery to systemic therapy. And Dr. Melissa McShane will now uh, give us a talk about that. Hi, thank you, Dr. Bleicher. So I'm Dr. Melissa McShane. I am a breast medical oncologist here at Fox Chase. And I'm going to be talking to you about advances in systemic therapy for breast cancer. Now, I'm going to be talking about advances just in the last year, um, and I've picked some of the most important ones, and we'll briefly go through those. Next slide. So um, I'll start with the treatment advances for hormone-positive HER2-negative breast cancer. And um, I didn't get to include it on this slide, but I did want to briefly mention something called the, um, the BCI test or the breast cancer index test. Um, and this is specific for patients with hormone positive, um, hormone receptor positive breast cancer. Um, and what this is, is it's basically a test that we will be sending on um, patients who have been on endocrine therapy for their breast cancer for five years. And what it tells us is if these patients would benefit from an additional five years of endocrine therapy. Um, there are a subset of patients who are higher risk and because of their specific tumor and the mutations that their tumor have, they benefit more from extended therapy. And so this is something that we will be, um, it's now in the NCCN guidelines and something we'll be using and talking to our patients more um, at that five-year mark. And now I want to talk about the RX Fonder results. Next slide. And so I think, you know, it's important anytime um, we're talking to a patient or their family or their advocate about um, the results of clinical studies and the drugs that we're using, um, it's really uh, important to remember that when we look at a clinical trial or a study, we want to look at how it affects our patient population. And um, as a patient or a family member or advocate of the patient, it's important that when your oncologist is talking about these studies and their results, it all depends on what were the group of patients that they looked at and do you fit that group of patients. And so one of the major goals in the advancement of oncological care is to improve our treatment options. And one major aspect of that is to be able to do something called the escalation of treatment or give, remove unnecessary treatment like chemotherapy from patients who don't need it. And so that is what um, this, uh, this study did. And so the question that they asked is basically in with women who have one to three positive nodes, and an oncotype less than 25, do they benefit from chemotherapy in addition to their endocrine therapy compared to endocrine therapy alone? And so um, an oncotype is what I like to call a, a report card for your, your breast cancer, for a hormone positive breast cancer. And it tells us how aggressive the breast cancer is. And we know with the previous um, trial, Taylor X, we were able to use this data in patients with early stage hormone positive breast cancer who had no positive nodes. And it was able to tell us whether these patients would benefit from chemotherapy. Now, this is looking to use this test in patients who have positive nodes. And so um, these are both pre and postmenopausal women. Uh, they had one to three positive nodes and an oncotype less than 25. Next slide. What this showed us is that in postmenopausal women, they had no benefit from chemotherapy if they hit all those markers. So less oncotype less than 25, they had one to three positive nodes. They did they did well with just endocrine therapy alone. They did not need chemotherapy. So we could use this information to, to confidently de-escalate their treatment or, or not have to give chemotherapy to this patient population. Now in the premenopausal patients, it did show that they benefited from chemotherapy. Next slide. And so the takeaway points uh, from this trial, I would say that we can safely avoid chemotherapy in postmenopausal women with positive notes. Um, and in premenopausal women, they did derive some additional benefit from the chemotherapy, although it is always still a discussion with the oncologist. It's not a hard and fast rule, and it's a discussion about the risks and the benefits in the, each specific patient um, and individualizing the care towards them. And then also this trial will follow patients for 15 years, so additional data and insights are to come. Next slide. 
Next, I want to um, provide some updates on the treatment advances for triple negative breast cancer. And I'll be looking at pembrolizumab and atezolizumab, which are both cancer immunotherapy drugs. Next slide. So just a quick review that what is cancer immunotherapy? And so um, immunotherapy is a form of biological therapy, which basically uses a patient's immune system to fight cancer. And so the way I like to explain it to patients is that cancer cells are really good at putting on a cloak of invisibility. You know, the immune system should be able to see them as foreign and fight them, but they, they are able to mask themselves. And so what this immunotherapy does is it tells the cancer cell and it causes the cancer cell to take off that cloak of invisibility so that our immune system can see it again. And so it stimulates our immune system to kill the cancer cell and it retrains our immune system to attack the cancer cells by seeing these cells. Next slide. And so this uh, major uh, trial called Keynote 522 basically looked at adding pembrolizumab, which is an immunotherapy drug, to patients with high-risk triple negative breast cancer. So high-risk means they either had positive nodes or they had a large tumor without any positive nodes. And the question they asked was, does adding this, chemo does adding this immunotherapy before we go to surgery and continuing it after improve the tumor's ability to decrease before um, decrease um, at the time of surgery, and does it prevent it from coming back? Next slide. What they found is that there was an improvement in pathological complete response, which means that more people had complete resolution of the tumor at the time of surgery when they got this medication along with chemotherapy before their surgery. And they also found that um, compared to just chemotherapy alone, they had an improvement in event-free survival, which means basically that more people were alive without disease progression when they got both the chemotherapy and immunotherapy. Next slide. Next slide. I think there might be a delay. Um, so I'll keep talking. Um, so the next thing I was going to mention is that um, this year we had a removal of um, atezolizumab uh, from the NCCN uh, guidelines and recommendations. Atezolizumab had been um, previously approved for the treatment of uh, metastatic, um, sorry, approved for triple negative breast cancer. Um, but unfortunately, um, further looks at the trial data um, show that there was no improvement with this medication. And so that has subsequently been removed. So as with, so Dr. McShane, as with everything that happens live, um, <laughs> so are the slide, um, slides in the background froze. Okay. So, um, uh, and then she just got kicked off of Zoom. <laughs> so if you can continue to talk, yeah, that would be great. That's fine. I just had one more. I just had one last um, thing to go over, which was metastatic um, per two positive breast cancer. Um, and so I'll, I'll say that um, we have an abundance of new medications um, in this, uh, in this disease, which is um, fantastic um, to have the ability and there's more medications coming down the line. But um, what we're recently looking at is these new medications that are coming out, can we be using them earlier in patients? And are patients doing better when we use them um, earlier? And there was a large trial called the Destiny Breast 03 trial, which basically showed that um, a medication called inher 2 um, did better than the previous medication, which was called TDM1. And so um, it just gives patients, um, a, it gave patients a longer time of um, disease-free progression, meaning they're living longer without their disease progressing. And so it just has opened up a lot more doors for patients with um, metastatic HER2-positive breast cancer. And that was the last slide I was going to go over. So I'll end it there. Thank you. Thank you. And um, to our Facebook audience, um, as with everything live, there are always challenges, whether it's television or social media. So as our staff at Fox Jays, who have really worked very hard on this, um, try to reboot their computers and get back online. Um, we will then move to Dr. Anderson. Um, uh, although we don't have the benefits of the slides at the moment, hopefully Sarah will uh, be able to get back on. So Dr. Anderson, if you can maybe give us a, you know, start us off even without the slides, that would be helpful. 
Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much. I'm uh, Dr. Penny Anderson, and I'm a breast radiation oncologist here at Fox Chase. So I want to just spend the next few minutes talking about advances in radiation therapy for breast cancer. So um, without, I don't know if the slides, looks like they might be trying. I'm just going to proceed on and hopefully the slides will catch up. So in general, um, when we talk about, um, when we think of cancer treatment, what we want to know is what impact will our particular treatment have on the patients? For example, how effective is the treatment that we're delivering? What's the toxicity and the side effects that the treatment may produce, both short-term and you know, long-term, which of course would translate to overall survival, or sorry, overall quality of life? And most importantly, and as importantly, what's the duration of the treatment course itself? So in the past, uh, traditionally, a course of uh, breast radiation treatments has been about six or six and a half weeks, which a lot of people are familiar with. And up until recently, that was considered the standard length of a course of breast radiation therapy. But now we have lots of published robust data that demonstrates that radiation therapy can be delivered in a shorter period of time. In other words, a less number of days and therefore fewer numbers of weeks of treatment that um, we have compared to when we used to treat patients over the six or seven weeks of radiation. And here at Fox Chase, we've implemented the shorter course of treatment. It's actually called hypofractionated radiation therapy. A lot of people are familiar with that term. In other words, it means less number of fractions of daily radiation treatments. So at Fox Chase, we now routinely offer this short course of treatment, which is only 20 treatments. So 20 days of radiation therapy or four weeks, as opposed to the uh, 30 or even more than 30 uh, treatments over the six or six and a half weeks, which we traditionally used to do. And this has greatly impacted our patients' lives, their quality of life with regards to their treatment. And this can be offered for both invasive cancer and DCIS or non-invasive treatment as well. So just as important as the effectiveness of the treatment is the toxicity, or in other words, the side effect profile of the treatment course. And we've demonstrated that this four week regimen results in similar side effects or toxicity as the longer traditional course of radiation. So therefore, for all the reasons I mentioned, hypofractionation is becoming the new standard of care in the treatment of breast cancer for many of our breast cancer patients. So what are the other goals of treatment? Uh, we wanna obviously minimize toxicity and specifically heart dose for left-sided breast cancer. So we have a very sophisticated treatment planning program and system where we actually can calculate the radiation dose to our normal organs like heart or lung, for example, to avoid these organs. And while at the same time delivering the radiation dose that we need to the breast or chest wall and lymph nodes. And we wanna be able to do this safely and effectively. So at Fox Chase, we've implemented the technology to do this called deep inspiration breath hold or DIBH for short which is when we have patients inhale and hold their breath so we can actually calculate and determine if this inhale uh, maneuver pulls the heart away from the radiation beam that's near the left breast or chest wall that we need to treat with our radiation uh, field. So with this technique, if, it deemed, if it's deemed appropriate for a patient, the patient actually holds their breath during the radiation beam on time in order to minimize the radiation dose or exposure to the heart. What I can't show you now because of our technical difficulties would be a depiction where we have the heart and the radiation beam in a free breathing um, position. Uh, some of the heart actually is in the radiation beam and would get exposed to radiation and therefore would increase the potential for cardiac toxicity. But when a woman or a man is in a breath hold technique, in other words, when they take a deep breath in and inhale, the heart is pulled out of the beam of radiation, thereby minimizing dose to the heart and minimizing therefore late cardiac side effects for the heart. So our department in um, doing DIBH, we actually have this technology called vision. Oh, okay. Can we just go to that picture? I just want to emphasize that the yellow is the radiation beam. So the image on the left labeled free breathing, you can see that that little red area is the heart. So in a free breathing position for this particular patient, the radiation beam is actually hitting the heart, thereby treating a portion of the heart that we want to avoid. And then depicted on the right is the deep inspiration breath hold. So when the patient takes a deep breath in, as you can see, it pulls the heart, which is in the middle of the field there, away from that yellow radiation beam, literally pulling it out of the radiation beam, thereby not receiving any dose and minimizing cardiac late toxicity, which is one of our many goals. So um, again, like I was saying, in order to do this, uh, procedure effectively, we have something called Vision RT, which is an alignment technology system that performs real-time surface tracking, which allows us to verify and make sure that our patients are in this accurate, precise treatment position before enduring their entire radiation course of treatment. And it ensures that we're safely and accurately delivering the proper effective radiation treatment dose while avoiding toxicity. 
So in summary, uh, we've made great strides in improving our patient's quality of life in terms of number one, shortening the overall length of treatment time from that six or seven weeks down to four weeks. Number two, we're decreasing the toxicity and side effects, especially the cardiac toxicity. And while at the same time, maintaining the excellent, you know, high rates of local control and improved outcomes for our patients with breast cancer. So thank you very much. So thank you, Dr. Anderson. That was outstanding, even without the slides. So <laughs> really excellent. So people have been making positive comments behind the scenes. So just so you're aware. So thank you. Thanks to all of you. So, um, so right now, um, we're going to open it up to questions from the audience. I'm going to just say, you know, ask the, the audience on Facebook to please feel free to drop a question in the chat function. Um, if we don't end up getting to your question this evening, We'll, um, uh, we'll be following up on those questions after the evening concludes. So I'm gonna have everybody sort of bring their um, video back and come back to us. And we're gonna start with our first question. It was actually submitted by somebody um, right off the bat. Um, and it looks like um, uh, Dr. Whitaker, this one is for you. Um, as a breast cancer survivor, and by the way, let me just sort of preface all of these to the Facebook audience we have tonight. So um, we can't actually give out individual medical advice. So um, questions that we have in general, we will be talking about sort of those general fields and that general information. For specific medical advice, best to talk to your individual practitioner. Um, so back to you, Dr. Whitaker. As a breast cancer survivor with two grown daughters, when is it recommended for them to start getting annual mammograms? Uh, I'm negative for any genetic breast cancer genes and I had triple negative breast cancer. My daughters are 35 and 32. I was 58 at diagnosis. So I think these questions about screening for family members, especially daughters, are always very important. So typically what we advise in these situations is that um, when you have a first degree relative, so a, a mom, for example, or a sister, for example, with breast cancer, that you start your breast cancer screening 10 years prior to her diagnosis, or at age 40. So we essentially say whichever one comes first. So in this case, you know, typically we would say around age 40 for your daughters based off of your age of diagnosis. Great, thank you. Um, Dr. McShane, um, somebody asked, after taking anastrozole for five years, will the side effects of bone loss, dry eyes and fat gain around the waist and stomach go away? That's a great question. Um, and so what we find is that when patients stop their anastrozole, um, their bone density does start to improve slightly. Um, and as far as weight gain um, and dry eyes, um, if the weight gain and dry eyes were driven by the medication, the medication should be out of your system within a few days to a week of stopping it. And so um, I don't think it, you know, it's going to cause weight loss from, from stopping the medication, but it, it won't contribute to additional weight gain. And so unfortunately, if it was driven by the medication, um, you know, it may need other <laughs> uh, efforts to try to lose it, but the dry eye should go away. If, if it was truly um, due to the medication, stopping the medication should allow that to recover. Great. Dr. Agon, for early stage breast cancer, have there been any clinical trials on recurrence of breast cancer and what do we know about that? So for early stage breast cancer, uh, we know that for local recurrence, we have over 20 years worth of data comparing lumpectomy or breast conservation, lumpectomy and radiation, comparing that to mastectomy. We have over 20 years of data looking that, showing that overall survival is the same. Um, and we have many, many studies looking at comparing local recurrence or what's the chance of it coming back at the side of the breast or the chest wall. Um, and they're very comparable. Um, so many years of clinical trials uh, looking at surgical types for early breast cancer. And then I think what's also important is um, for early breast cancer, what's the chance of it coming back somewhere else in the body uh, in the future? Um, and that's really where I think um, research uh, looking at oncotype um, and uh, the, the medical oncology colleagues can speak to that um, has been helpful in identifying, um, you know, helping to estimate what those risks are and then clinical trials looking at different medications to try and minimize that risk. So let me also ask, so since we all have a lot of data on that topic with in relation to the radiation trials, 
and radiation reduction of local recurrence. Dr. Anderson, can you maybe comment on local recurrence of breast cancer and the effects of your field on that? You're muted. As Allison had mentioned, uh, same thing, lots of decades of data showing that um, women outcome is, is similar compared to mastectomy or breast conserving surgery with radiation. So um, it's nice that women have options for most of these early stage breast cancer cases. Dr. McShane, you were shaking your head when Dr. Agon was talking in agreement. Was there something that you were thinking of or wanted to add on that topic? When she was mentioning the oncotype and how that is helping us um, in, in determining these patients who are at higher risk for um, recurrence or distant disease and, and helping navigate us in how to escalate their treatment when including chemotherapy. And we just have more of these resources now to try to help kind of hopefully predict um, and better um, determine which patients would benefit from more escalated treatment given their higher risk of recurrence. Great. Um... Actually, Dr. McShane, while I have you, um, somebody asked, have the survival rates for inflammatory breast cancer improved over the last several years? Great question. Um, I'm not sure if the, I, I can't, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I'd have to look to see if uh, the exact numbers, I haven't um, looked to see if that, but overall it has Im improved with, um, you know, the advent of additional, uh, depending, actually, I guess it depends on which is driving the inflammatory cancer, what is the subtype of the cancer, um, but not to, I don't know the exact data for that one off the top of my head right now. So I can also chime in on this. So, yeah. um, so we do know that there has been an improvement in um, local control in inflammatory breast cancer, because it used to be many, many decades ago that people would treat this with um, surgery first. And we found there have been studies showing that chemotherapy prior to surgery has a significant impact on local control along with radiation after surgery. And so um, those have actually improved the outcomes of inflammatory breast cancer by creating this sort of like standard sandwich of doing chemotherapy first. Um, if the, the tumor responds to chemotherapy, then surgery, then radiation, if the tumor does not respond to the chemotherapy up front, then they get radiation and then they will get their surgery. Dr. Whitaker, was there anything that you would want to add on that topic? Yeah, I mean, I think Dr. Bleicher, you, I think you point out kind of a relevant point that I think just our approach to treatment for inflammatory breast cancer patients has improved. And as far as I know, there actually has been a significant improvement when we compare data essentially over a 30, 40 year period, you know, patients in the 1970s compared to patients now with inflammatory breast cancer definitely have longer survival. We have data, I think that's shown that. Great, thank you. Dr. McShane, I'm putting you in the hot seat yet again. Um, so a question just came in, is there an alternative to tamoxifen? I'm worried about side effects. Yes, there is an uh, alternative to moxifen, it, but it depends on several factors. Um, it depends on menopausal status um, and the, the grade of the tumor, the um, stage of the tumor. So um, apart from tamoxifen, there's the aromatase inhibitors, which is our standard of care um, first line in women who are postmenopausal. But we also use these um, medications in premenopausal women who are at higher risk and we use that, but we have to use that in combination with something called ovarian suppression. And the reason we do that is because these medications um, do not work um, as well when a patient still has functioning ovaries. Um, and so uh, in order to use the aromatase inhibitors, you have to take an injection um, to suppress the ovaries or put them into a menopausal state. And so while there are other, there are other options, options to tamoxifen, um, it, do, it does depend on the patient, their menopausal status, um, and the risk of their disease. Wonderful. Dr. Abbott, um, can you explain to patients the difference between a diagnostic mammogram and a screening mammogram? Yes, yeah, so um, the difference between a diagnostic screening and a screening mammogram is what we call it. 
Um, so here at Fox Chase, um, if you get, if you're um, here for a diagnostic mammogram, it's because you have a symptom um, or if it's because you had a recent diagnosis of breast cancer um, and you're within three years of your surgery. Um, and then all our patients get screening mammograms. Um, for a diagnostic mammogram, we check them immediately. Um, and if we need any additional imaging, if we need an ultrasound, we do it right away. Uh, for screening mammograms, for patients who are seeing our wonderful clinicians, um, we check them right away as well um, and do the same thing. We do additional imaging and ultrasound. Um, so there's, there's really not a huge difference besides um, what we're calling it for the patient. Wonderful. Thank you. And um, as we're running out of time, I think this will be our last question for now. And this is going to go to Dr. Anderson. Um, Dr. Anderson, somebody asked, does the deep inspiration breath treatment that you described lengthen the time of treatment? That's a great question. It does lengthen the treatment by um, maybe a minute or so on the machine, laying on the machine. And just to be clear, the person's not holding their breath during the entire four or five minutes of treatment. They basically hold their breath. We turn the radiation beam on after 10 to 15 seconds. They, we turn the beam off, they can exhale and then re, you know, inhale again. So they're not, they're not like an athletic swimmer where they have to hold it for five or 10 minutes, but it does, it does increase people being on the table a couple minutes longer. And, um, which you know, can be significant if someone's having back issues or the treatment position can be a little uncomfortable with their arms over their heads, but, but not significant, but it does increase it by several minutes. Great, thank you. Well, listen, everybody, that's our time for the evening. We really appreciate your spending the time to us, spending the time with us. Um, so thanks again to our exhibitors and our advocacy organizations for their support. And certainly to my really brilliant colleagues who have really um, given us a lot of information to, uh, to learn this evening and for joining us this evening. So we will be hosting several Together Facing events this fall, including Together Facing GYN Cancer next week. So I would ask all of our viewers to please check our website and the Facebook page for more information. So everybody, thank you, have a great night and take care.